would just like to welcome everybody to our fourth and final webinar of our webinar series here with the North Dakota Livestock Alliance. So thank you so much to our sponsors, the North Dakota Ethanol Council and North Dakota Pulse Growers Association, or excuse me, Northern Pulse Growers Association. And also to a reminder that we are going to have everybody muted on entry, but you will be able to unmute and ask questions at the end of the presentation. You can also contact us through the comment box or you can raise a hand if you need to, but uh, we're, we're pretty chill with how we do these webinars. So don't be shy to, to ask any questions. Um, as I said, this will be recorded and will be posted on the ndlivestock.org website as are the previous three webinars. So please mark that bookmark that website on your on your browser so that you can reference it quickly. Um, our door prize, thank you to the Northern Pulse Growers Association, is an instant pot. And if anybody has used these yet, they are absolutely awesome for pulse preparation, especially your pintos and chickpeas, which I love. So um, lots of cool recipes online, and there's also really good instant pot. Uh, cookbooks that come along with it. So thank you so much again to Brian over at Northern Pulse Growers for donating that door prize. At the end of the presentation, I will do a random drawing out of the participants today and we will get that shipped out to you. Uh, so starting out with our wonderful presenter who many of us have had the pleasure of hearing before. This is Dr. Carl Hoppe, Extension Specialist with NDSU Carrington Research Center. So as you all know, Dr. Hoppe has been with NDSU for a long time. We are so proud to have him. And he has over 30 years of working with North Dakota cattle producers. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Hoppy. It sure seems like out West here, we are going to, to need to do a lot of improvising in the feed bunk with how dry things already are. So we look forward to hearing from you and your advice on how to get through yet another interesting weather spell here. Take it away. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Certainly do appreciate it. Yeah, the topic you wanted me to visit on today would be diversifying the feed bunk. So if you haven't figured this already out, uh, this is going to be more slanted towards ruminant animals, mostly sheep, uh, I mean, mostly beef cattle producers, although we could add sheep producers and goat producers in with that too. But by and large, it's going to be for beef cattle producers in North Dakota. So the title again is diversifying the feed bunk uh, for the North Dakota Livestock Alliance winter webinar series. Well, um, Winter's in our rearview mirror. It doesn't go away. Uh, we'll be seeing some more of it in southeastern North Dakota today with the forecasts of snow. But uh, our uh, ranchers in North Dakota and our feedlot operators certainly have to deal with the long feeding season um, when the grass turns white and we have to start feeding stored feeds. A lot of our feeds are produced on farm, but on the other hand, uh, we can certainly produce we can buy feeds from other locations, and that's what I'll be talking about today. We've been feeding cattle in North Dakota for centuries, because, or at least over a century, because um, of our extended winter season. Um, we do have some grazing opportunities in winter, but for the most part, a lot of our winters have a lot of snow on the ground. So if you're in the eastern part of the state, you're used to feeding cattle four to five to six months out of the winter, maybe even longer. Here at Carrington, we actually have a dry lot cow herd, which means that we uh, feed our cattle throughout the whole year in dry lot or in the feed yard. And uh, it's been going on for over 40 years. We works very well, it can easily be done. So my point is, is if we do run into a really extended drought, feeding cows with calves during the summertime in a feed lot is really nothing new. It's been done for a long time, works quite well. We just need to balance the rations accordingly to have it work. When we think about looking at the feed bunk and what we need to feed cattle, we look at energy needs. And that's usually where we focus on our supplemental feed, getting enough energy into the animals. North Dakota usually has enough byproduct feeds out there, excuse me, uh, co uh, um, I don't want to call it waste feeds, but non-grain feeds. In other words, corn stover or wheat straw or some type of low quality feed, could even be cattails, that we can give to a ruminant to eat but they certainly don't supply enough energy to the animals, so we need to add extra energy. Corn grain is usually the cheapest way to do that, and quite frankly, it sets the price of energy for the rest of the feeds. Unique advantages for corn is it's easily stored, can be transported along hundreds of miles or, or even by a rail car if we need to. Um, if we process it, we'll improve the digestibility of the corn. We have lots of options when we're dealing with corn. Um, if we deal with the grain, we can 
buy it dry, or if we raise it, we can put it up as high moisture. We can even transport high moisture if we want to. We could look at raising ear corn, ear leach, silage, or looking at, like I said, stover. So corn is a, a really uh, viable source of feed for our cattle in the feed bunks. And corn grain usually sets the price for energy needs. Cattle also need protein as well. So when we're looking for supplemental protein, uh, we can get that from a lot of different sources. North Dakota is home to oil seeds. Uh, uh, we produce them. We actually crush them too to make oil out of them. What's left over is the meal. Soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, linseed meal, which comes from flax, are all out of uh, produced in North Dakota and crushed in North Dakota. We do have other protein, high protein feeds. Distillers grains is quite prevalent for ethanol plants. And we'll talk about that later. And don't forget field peas and lentils. They are high in protein and work quite well as a protein supplement in these particular, uh, when you're looking at adding protein to our feed bunks. Actually, if you're eating filled peas and lentils, not only do they provide protein, but they provide quite a bit of energy. And they're similar to what corn would be, so they're a nice alternative. Of course, the, the queen of forages is gonna be alfalfa, and we produce quite a bit of alfalfa in North Dakota, and that's usually high in protein as well, as providing a nice roughage source for our livestock, as well as clovers can be raised too. Although be careful of raising sweet clover and sweet clover poisoning, but uh, clovers can certainly be grown in North Dakota. We do have oil seeds that we can feed for protein supplements. So usually oil seeds have extra oil in them. Of course, they're oil seeds. And if we feed too much oil, we can decrease the digestibility of the feeds and cause cattle to go off feed because oil is toxic to the rumen microbes. So a little bit's okay. A lot can be a bad deal. So three, four pounds might be the ad limiting amount of oil seeds added to a cow ration. But there's a lot of different sources and supplemental feeds when it comes to protein for North Dakota. So I do need to comment though, when we look at supplement, supplementing our cattle, we need to supplement what's lacking in the forages. So uh, first thing I look at is usually energy, but we do, most people talk about protein. We need to have some amount of fiber in a ruminant diet just so they can chew their cud. If we got them just straight corn rations, they wouldn't have enough fiber there to to, to chew their cud and that'll lead to poor digestibility and even rumen acidosis and other issues. We need to look at vitamins and minerals. And quite frankly, all those probably need to be supplemented when we're looking at supplements to match our forages. So we need to look close at what's available. You wanna point out that co-product feeds work well as a supplement. A lot of times, for example, if we've got uh, low quality pasture, it needs a little extra protein and needs a little extra phosphorus, That's exactly what some co-products would be high in, so it blends quite well. Now, their co-products are not balanced nutritionally, but they can work as a supplement. They really do work well as, a, as an ingredient in commercial feeds that are then blended with other things to make them nutritionally balanced. And that's why feed companies have been in business for years, uh, creating those type of complete feeds that will blend together grains, co-products, minerals, additives, but usually put it into a pellet and uh, works quite well for feeding. Look like make a few comments here on, on the word co-product or byproduct. Um, it all started with the grain milling industry many years ago. And the purpose was to, you know, rich people had uh, white flour. They didn't use whole wheat flour, they used white flour. And that was kind of the, the go-to thing. So why did they grain mill the grain to produce um, this clean flour? Okay, what was left over then was just a byproduct and they got rid of it as cheap as they could. And that's where feed companies got a lot of their starts and where that go to it went into our cattle feed or pig feed. But usually most of these feeds are usually high in fiber, low in starch. And that's exactly what cattle can use, but not necessarily pigs. On pigs, it's more as a laxative, but on cattle, they can certainly digest the fiber. It works quite well. So as we had increased the amount of value in these feeds, we now renamed the whole thing into co-product. That's a little history lesson between byproduct is now a higher expensive thing called co-product. We raise a lot of different co-products in North Dakota. It's almost amazing. When I get the opportunity to visit with my colleagues out of state and visit what they have for a milling industry, um, I come back to North Dakota and realize how fortunate we are. We just have a lot of, uh, value-added processing that's done in North Dakota to our feeds. We do ship a lot of it out of the state, of course, but we do have a lot of feeds in state, um, and which makes us uh, a real opportunity to feed in our livestock if needed. We have ethanol plants. If you notice, they're located uh, where the yellow dots are, which is gonna be in the Red River Valley, and then along the 
I-29 corridor for the most part, and then down in South Dakota as well, the, near the North Dakota, South Dakota border. Um, we have wheat mids, wheat milling facilities located in Grand Forks and, and uh, Carrington, as well as Minot, and then down near uh, Richland County, there's another one, Fairmont. We have oil crushes scattered throughout the state, uh, both up at Belva and down at Enderlin, and then in West Fargo. Uh, there is another one over there, uh, over in Minnesota, up across from uh, the Pembden Walsh counties. We do produce malt. Well, we used to produce a lot of malt in Stutzman County. They closed down that facility. Now there's a small amount of malt production, malt byproduct being created uh, put in Moorhead. Uh, we do have some sugar beet factories uh, up and down the, the Red River, as well as out in uh, near Sydney, Montana. They would produce beet pulp and beet tailings. And of course, we do have a couple of potato waste facilities, potato facilities that create potato waste both in Grand Forks and Jamestown. So we find out we have a lot of different co-products available in North Dakota to us. And people that are located very close to those plants are familiar with what they are and what the price is and, and how it works. As you get further away, freight becomes a problem and the cost of that co-product feed increases equally when the freight is increased. So, need to watch that when we do our calculations of what the cost of feed would be if we use co-products. So co-products, how much do we produce in North Dakota? Well, um, our state mill and elevator, it started uh, almost 100 years ago. It is actually the largest Durham mill, wheat Durham mill in one location in the world. Now there are other mills that are bigger, companies that are bigger than our North Dakota mill and state mill and elevator, but they're located in lots of different locations. But we're the Singus mill in one location in the world. So it mills 90,000 bushels of wheat a day. Um, that produces um, 70, 700 tons of wheat mids a day. So let me just do some math here for you. At 700 tons of wheat mids a day, we could provide 10 pounds of wheat mids per cow per day for 140,000 head of cattle. North Dakota has almost a million head. So when we look at this, um, we, we can feed 15% of the cow herd or um, 10 pounds of wheat mids, which should supply the crude protein requirements for a cow for the for the day. So we can, and that's every day. So in the summertime, we have to find a home for that, which would probably go to backgrounding calves or creep feed, that type of thing. We mids are 18% protein, 83% TDN. They're low in calcium, high in phosphorus. They're a nice addition to a roughage ration. We had other willing milling facilities in North Dakota. One's located in Carrington here, at Dakota Growers, which is now owned by Post. Art and milling. Uh, down to Fairmont, Minot Milling, which is part of Philadelphia, Macaroni and Minot, and then there's a plant up in Candu. That's actually fairly small. Um, estimate, we don't know exactly how much they produce, but combined it's probably 65,000 bushels of Durham's a day. So again, we produce another 500 tons. So add that plus North Dakota Mill and Elevator, we could feed a quarter of a million head of cattle at 10 pounds of wheat mids per day, just in what we produce in North Dakota as byproduct or co-product feeds wheat mids. But Let's think about the ethanol plants in North Dakota. We have five corn distilleries. We have two that produce 100 million gallons uh, a year and three that produce uh, 50,000, around, excuse me, 50 million gallons a year. And with that, uh, they produce, yes, 35 to 4,000 tons of distillers cranes per day on a dry matter basis. That's about three times as much wheat mids as we produce. And I thought that was a big number. So with our North Dakota cow inventory at least than a million cattle, we could have, uh, we could feed seven pounds of wheat mids to cow every day, even when she's out on pasture. We have that much feed. Seven pounds would provide enough protein for the cow, um, quite a bit of energy as well, or we could feed uh, 12 pounds for seven months in the wintertime. We produce that much co-product feed. So if we're, look, if we're facing a drought and we need feed, we do have products produced in North Dakota that can help us out. Now, wheat mids is 30% protein, high in energy content, it's low in calcium, and actually high in phosphorus. So we need to be careful about how much uh, phosphorus, and it can be high in sulfur as well. So we usually limit the incorporation of distillage grains to 30% of the diet on a dry matter basis. Uh, there are ethanol, other ethanol, well, this is a list of the ethanol plants in North Dakota. We got the five corn distilling plants, Theraldson, Hankinson's, uh, Dakota Spirit, Blue Flint, and Red Trail. And then there's another 
ethanol plant that just came online within the past year, and it's called the Red River Biorefinery. It takes potato waste and beet tailings, and uh, they turn that, they pump it, grind it, and uh, turn it into ethanol, and what's left over is, is a biorefinery solids. That's, uh, that's, uh, can be fed to cattle. That's a picture of the plant there in its last stages of completion. Distillers grains, corn distillers grains, uh, there's really three different types here. Uh, dry, which can be shipped all over the nation. Modified, which is 50% moisture. And then the wet product, which has just got more moisture in it. And usually uh, when people talk about wet, that comes out of the Castleton plant in North Dakota. The plants all produce it modified. There is a liquid that's produced periodically and it's called corn distill um, condensed distillery solubles. That's hard to say. So they either say CDS or corn syrup. And it's about 60 to 70% moisture, about the same as wet distillers grains, except wet is a, is a, a firm product while corn syrup is a liquid product. But be careful, um, that stuff can settle out. It needs to be agitated, it works quite well in a diet. And most distilleries uh, end up putting that on top of the distillers grains. And that's why it's called distillers grains with solubles. Um, of course, this adds a lot of protein, energy, and cattle find this a delectable treat to eat, or maybe what we could say is very palatable to eat. I do put together a co-product list, and it's available from your county extension agents in North Dakota. Just go to the agent and your local agent and ask them um, for the most recent list. It's usually put out two or three times a year. Um, it gives you an idea of uh, kind of what prices are at that particular time, as well as the phone numbers to call. We do have it on a website listed down below. You just go to our Extension Livestock webpage and then go to Livestock Management. And underneath that, go to Nutrition. And underneath that, look for our co-products produced in North Dakota website. Gives you an idea, at least you know what the phone numbers are recently and kind of a, a price of what's available at the time. So let's keep talking here. Short hay, are you short in hay supplies? What do you do? You really have two choices. You can replace the hay with grains or you can replace it with co-products. Our grains in North Dakota, when I moved here 30 years ago, we didn't have that much corn, but now we have a lot of corn. So corn is at the top of the list, barley, oats, wheat, field peas, don't forget field peas, they work very well in these rations, as well as lentils, and then grain screenings. And a lot of these feeds all have grain screenings. And at one time they used to be high in weed seeds, now not so much, but I do may need to make a note there's some noxious weeds out there that you really don't want to get started in North Dakota. So be careful where you get your grain screens from. If uh, you're getting them out of a certain part of your local area in North Dakota, and that's where your weed seeds um, originate from, then you're probably just reinseeding your own, what you've got locally. But if you bring things from out of state and bring it into North Dakota, you could be setting yourself up for an issue. I'm thinking of things like Palmer Amaranth. Just be careful when you're dealing with grain screenings. And if you are feeding those, uh, the weed seeds can be viable, um, uh, even if they've passed through the animal. Uh, it might be a small percentage, but still that small percentage can still be a viable seed. Oh, instead, another option is to replace hay with co-products. Like I said, we produce the most of distillers grains. We have wheat mids. Soy hulls are another feed, as well as corn gluten feed, barley malt sprouts, uh, beet pulp, either wet or dry and uh, potato byproducts, and then the protein meals, soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, and seed meal. Um, there's just a whole plethora of things that we can include, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Dr. Hoppy, if I can interrupt, yes. we do have a yes. question in the chat box. How long can you store the wet DDGs? Or well, wet DDGs will tend to start molding um, if it's uncovered in three to five to 10 to 15 days, depending upon what the weather is. Okay, if you want to keep it from molding, the best thing to do is to keep it from drying out, and that would be by covering it with plastic as soon as you get it so it doesn't dry out. And then it'll actually store quite well. I didn't give an endpoint because everybody seems to be unique, and most people don't like to wrap it up, uh, but we've stored it um, two, three, four, five, six months. I've seen reports out in Nebraska that would indicate that that doesn't create a deleterious problem by storing it other than try to manage the mold issue there. And the best way to do that is by covering it up with plastic so air can't get into the, the feed and dry it out. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit more about distillers grains. It's very palatable and mixed wells with other feeds. It's high in ruminant and degradable protein if we need that. 
Um, it used to be up to 15% fat. Now it's only six or nine percent fat, so it doesn't harden up as a dry feed as as bad as what it used to. Um, your wet feeds will still have that six to seven percent uh, fat as well. Uh, energy content is usually uh, uh, quite 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 comparable to corn. And actually, in some research projects, the wet distillage grains might even have more energy value in it than what corn has. Usually we limit to 30% of the diet. I said that earlier, and that's because of sulfur issues. We may create a sulfur toxicity, and some people might call that polio. Um, but just be aware that if you go beyond that, um, you can probably get by on a cow diet up to 50% of the ration. Of course, at that point, you're not feeding it as a protein source, you're feeding it as an energy source. And for some people, that might end up being a cheaper energy source than what corn would be. But at least consider there might be issues when you go above 30% of the diet. Wheat mitts is another choice. It's uh, 16 to 18% protein, 83% TDN, 3% fat. It's high in phosphorus. Uh, if you're going to be feeding it, you should really provide some calcium supplementation, just like you would with the distiller's grains. Um, pelleted feeds are usually twice as dense as the meal. So a lot of time wheat mids are, are bought as pelleted, although you can buy it as a meal. A lot of our feed manufacturers, uh, they'll actually either buy it as the meal or they'll buy it as a pelleted form, regrind it, then make it into another pellet. Uh, storage becomes an issue with wheat mids because it likes to take moisture out of the air. So if you can put it on some type of moist uh, um, air floor, that would be the best. Uh, if you put it on top of concrete, you might be surprised there'd be three to six inches of, of moldy um, wheat mids at the bottom of the uh, pile in a couple months, just because it can take moisture out. Um, corn gluten feed is something I usually don't talk too much about because uh, Quite frankly, the, the dairy facilities in Minnesota and South Dakota found out how well this works in a dairy cow ration, that corn gluten feed is basically sold as wet now and contracted out. And if you tried to get some dried product on the spot market, you would have to go down to Nebraska. Um, it's just that Wapton has done a very good job of uh, selling corn gluten feed and it's worked quite well. And it fits, uh, it, it's a unique product. Um, it's not like ethanol, it's where you, mill out the, uh, it's a wet milling process where you take out the high fructose corn syrup. What's left over is gonna be what they call gluten feed. There's something called gluten meal that's usually included in, in pig rat, excuse me, dog rations or cat, cat food. Um, but uh, usually it's priced fairly high as well. Again, the corn gluten feed works great in dairy rations. It works well in feedlots too, but right now availability is pretty tight. And if you can see the calcium phosphorus ratio has got the same problems as well, the sulfur can be the same problem as well. Soy hulls work really well in a lot of rations. Uh, they're a good digestible fiber source. Uh, ADM, which is a plant at Enderlin, uh, has crushed soy hulls, has crushed soybeans to produce soy hulls. Although right now they're a swing plant and they're crushing something else. So if you wanna get soy hulls in North Dakota, you'll have to go across the border in the South Dakota to AGP and uh, get soy hulls there. They're high in energy content, relatively speaking, think of it like barley, um, but it's all out of fiber. Um, it's eight to 13% crude protein. Be sure to see how much protein it actually has because some of these samples come down quite low and others might be higher. It all depends, kind of depends upon the plant. Um, it's very palatable. A uniqueness about soy hulls is that they're high in calcium. Notice the calcium to phosphorus ratio is at least two to one which is really good for preventing urinary calculi and ruminants. Um, it works great in sheep rations. So you'll find sheep producers hunting this out as a nice source to add to the ration. Of course, it works well in our cow rations and sheep rations. Right now, unfortunately, um, according to my math, it's actually priced pretty high. So as a source of, of energy, corn would fit actually better today. We do have beef pulp and tailings. And there's our different plants across North Dakota. Um, we used to have a lot of beet pulp, excuse me, beet tailings available, but since the ethanol plant started in, in Grand Forks, not as much as that is available. And so consequently, um, now people are, people that used to use beet tailings are scrambling for beet pulp. And now the guys that used to use beet pulp are wanting more beet pulp. So it's beginning to be a little bit of a challenge. And if you go to the plants to try to get it, um, availability uh, might be on a contract basis. So be sure to uh, inquire the availability of it before you start looking for uh, beet pulp. And another problem is beets are processed in the wintertime 
And as soon as the summer becomes available, the processing plants stop, they process their beets for the year. So if we're having a drought in the summertime, beet pulp and tailings usually doesn't fit in unless you've already logged in a big supply of pelleted beet pulp. And uh, I don't think that's available too much. Protein sources are always available in North Dakota. Um, canola meal, we got four different plants producing it. We have linseed meal, uh, sunflower meal, two different plants, especially enderlin. Uh, usually sunflower meal is very competitively priced um, compared to the other meals. And then of course, if you want soybean meal, you can go to ADN or Enderlin or AGP and um, Aberdeen. Uh, usually soybean meal is a Cadillac of meals. It's actually the Cadillac price of meals too. So these other ones usually are canceled into their beef cattle rations first. Um, oh, excuse me. Grains and co-products will need different mineral supplementations. I'd like to point that out, that there is a problem with the phosphorus content always being high in these feeds. When you mill out the starch, what's left over is gonna be three times higher in concentration. And so we need to balance the ration. So we provide adequate calcium to offset the phosphorus. Uh, too high of phosphorus can lead to hoof problems, urinary calculi problems, uh, a lot of bone issues possibly. So at least balance the ration. The good news about this is limestone is fairly cheap. So the cost of balancing these rations gets to be um, not that big of an issue, just an issue of doing it. There is some research here that I can point out that we've done at Carrington. We've looked at barley malt products and wheat mids. We looked at co-products for potatoes. We looked at soybeans as a, as a, as a canola meal in our feeds. We've uh, looked at wet distillers, more wet distillers and soy hauls. We looked at uh, wet or dry distillers. Um, again, another project on distillers in a natural feeding situation without ionophores. Um, we looked at distillers grains and its effect in the manure. So there's a lot of research in all these co-products that's actually been done in North Dakota. So what I'm getting at is um, feel comfortable in feeding these things. It's, we've been researching it for years. Uh, it's been used out in the industry quite well. It's just a matter of trying to find out how it fits into your situation when it comes to cost. Corn stover and distillers grains, we've looked at that. And of course you can make a blend of that instead of using hay. And that would certainly work in a drought condition. Um, there are different types of distillers for the most part, the fat levels are all the same now, but in case you are getting something from someplace else, you need to be aware there might be differences between different plants. Um, Let's see, uh, I've already talked about this, but I do like to make the point out, all these co-products need calcium supplementation except for beet pulp and soy hulls. Those two are actually already high. Soy hulls are naturally high in calcium. Beet pulp in the extraction process of getting the sugar out of the pulp, they add uh, lime, is, a limestone is included. So you end up, you find out that the beet pulp, uh, the calcium content of the beet pulp is actually quite high. So that works quite well. Uh, as a blend, if you have available. Well, here's some rations I'd like to talk about. This is uh, feeding a beef cow, a 1400 pound cow. She's mature, late gestation, looking half a pound to gain, half a pound per day gain. Um, we could feed her on all hay ration, uh, sweet straw with some wheat straw, or excuse me, feed her a, an alfalfa hay ration with some wheat straw. And it would cost us about $1.68 a day. Or we could feed her an all grass ration. You can see the prices over here that I have for the feeds. The, the grass hay ration, if that's all they got, would cost about 20 cents a hay, 20 cents a day less than using the wheat straw and alfalfa hay because alfalfa hay prices have gone up because it's a protein source and highly digestible. We look at a mixture of grass hay and corn stover to cheapen up the ration. We need to add some protein to the ration. So we'd have to add three pounds of canola meal. And of course the cost goes up because of the additional cost of the canola meal. Or we can do a mixture of alfalfa hay, grass hay, and corn stover. You can see um, it's still going to cost a buck and three quarters a day, or somewhere over a dollar and a half a day to feed cows. And of course, they all need some mineral added to them just to make the balance ration. So there's not a cheap way in which to feed cows using co products, but there is a way to feed cows co products. So let's look at some more of these co products. The previous one looked at canola meal. These are going to look at wheat mids and beet tailings. So the first ration is alfalfa hay, grass hay, wheat straw, beet tailings, and you can see it's a dollar and a half a day. Now, beet tailings are exceedingly cheap. So if we uh, mix that with cheap wheat straw 
and take out the alfalfa hay and add in wheat mids instead, we're actually got a cheaper ration of a dollar and a quarter. Now for a lactation ration, we would have to increase the amount of energy to these cattle, either by more total feed or by adding corn or even more wheat mids. And uh, of course our price would go up if we did that. You can see there's other combinations to be used to um, in doing these rations. Now let's go to one more slide for some more diets. Uh, we can do a combination of distillers grains in these rations along with corn, or we can use corn stover, or uh, and then all the base diets usually have a little bit of hay or straw. And in the right combination, we can end up with a ration that's going to cost a dollar and a half or up to a dollar sixty or more per day uh, to feed these cows. If it's going to be lactation, it's going to be a little bit more. But my point is, is it really depends upon which just which uh, co-product source you'd want to use and what other feedstuffs you have at home to blend together to make a decent ration for your cattle. And the other thing to consider is the freight cost in order to haul your, your co-product to wherever you're at. Obviously in the Eastern part of the state, if you can focus your rations on beet pulp, that'll be a lot cheaper than somebody who's out in um, Bowman, North Dakota, looking to uh, incorporate beet pulp into their ration their freight cost would be quite high. Um, beet pulp is 70 to 80% water, so you're hauling a lot of water in that type of deal. So they'd probably wanna look at a dry product instead of a wet product. Okay. Um, if you wanna increase more energy in the ration, that would be for really cold weather or for um, lactation, which would be this time of the year. We can easily do that with co-products, just adding a few more pounds of each works quite well. I always en encourage people to consider rations for gestation of doing a half a pound to a pound per day, especially in a drought to get cows back into condition because more than likely if they've been out on grass, they might have lost condition or weight when they are out grazing. I'd like to make my last comment here, well-fed cows produce healthy calves. So don't cheapen up during a drought. Don't make your cows lose too much weight during a drought. Be sure to uh, add extra extra ingredients to the ration so the cow can produce enough milk and keep in good condition for herself. And of course, breed back so we can have another crop in another year, another calf crop in another year. Um, parting comment would be always look at, uh, at contracting co-products for early, for availability for sure. And usually if you contract them in the summertime, the prices for these, co uh, for these co-products are usually lower. So with that in mind, there's a, an opportunity to, uh, with co-products, always look for them early in the season. Don't wait until you absolutely need it uh, to start looking. It'll be to your advantage to price early and look early and, and do your rations accordingly. So with that, I just want to give a parting word and, and certainly visit about any questions or comments, but uh, enjoy my favorite food and that'd be beef. So with that, are there any comments or questions there, Amber? Uh, there is one from Robert Farabee. He is, he just wanted to share with the group that there is a bee plant at City, Montana as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, one thing I did want to add in too is the financial benefit of feeding any of these biofuel co-products, whether that be DDGs or whatever it, that you tie into your ration, a financial benefit that might apply to you as well is that can help qualify you for the Bank of North Dakota's biofuels pace interest buy-down program. Oh. So if that's something that you haven't looked into yet or if someone is seeking out any kind of kind of lending like that, that actually could be a benefit for you as a producer as well to um, maybe justify that cost of seeking out the DDGs or any of the other ethanol byproducts as well or biodiesel. Hmm. Excellent, thank you. Amber, mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Brian. Um, Carl. What are your thoughts on, um, I'll put my video on, feeding um, hay, barley, and peas. And I have guys that, I was up at the KMOT show this week, and there's some guys feeding lactating cows, some of that. And But my question is, your thoughts on that, but if you put hay, barley, and peas together, and you want to just cut it and put it in a windrow, is it best to let that, let that dry out a little bit before you run the cows and and graze on that or what's your thoughts on that? Oh, my first thought was you're feeding hay barley and field pea grain separately. But no, you're looking at feeding 
ra raising the two feeds together and putting yes. it in the windrow. Yeah. Um, you know, people do swath grazing. Uh, the problem you have to worry about with swath grazing, if you do it too early in the season and you get too much rain on it, you can have a lot of mold underneath. Mm -hmm. So you need to be careful that, uh, you know, a lot of swath grazing or that swath and just leave it there. Um, is really swath later in the season, usually in the fall when the weather's, when the temperature gets colder and there's less rain available. Um, it works, but doing it in June, which is normally when hay barley would be available to be cut, the end of June, first part of July, uh, that's a little too long to let swath grazing go on. Um, although if he's gonna graze it right away in the summertime, that's probably a really good idea. Okay. Because uh, uh, cattle have a real problem with trampling feed into the ground. So if they're gonna swath it, uh, yeah, maybe they won't waste as much then. And it would all be harvested at the right time too. But I would uh, be a little bit worried about mold and waste. I'm so not you, mold what are your thoughts on making that in the silage? I had a guy been doing that. He cut that as the, the hay and the peas together in, into a silage. Works really well. Just pack it and cover it okay. and it'll last all winter long. Okay, yeah. that's all my questions. <laughs> oh, very good questions. And I did want to share with you, Carl, that I, my phone has been chiming nonstop throughout your presentation here that apparently this cold snap made everybody's heifers calve. So <laughs> there's a lot of requests for the recordings. So um, if anybody on the call as well, if any of your friends or colleagues have been saying, hey, I want this recording, we'll get this up as soon as we possibly can. And yeah, well, that's a good point about calving. It's, it never <laughs> fails. Cows always want to calve before the storm, not hold on to them until after the storm. They always have to have them just before the storm comes through. So, yeah, my personal record is 38 during a blizzard. That was my personal record. <laughs> I never want to match that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love dairy. You never know what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions out there? Anybody? Okay, you can also, uh, Dr. Hoppy's contact information will be available on our website as well. So if something does come up, um, we will definitely make sure that you're able to get a hold of him. And I see Robert Farabee just asked also to keep everybody posted on the feedlot school. Yeah, we'll have another feedlot school the end of January, usually that third week of January on a, third, on a Wednesday, Thursday. I believe it's the 20th to the 21st for next year of 2022. So um Send me an email so I can put you on the wait list. And that way I'll send it to my secretary and she'll put us on the wait list and she'll get in touch with you. Um, because our feedlot school has been going on for 25 years and uh, we tend to have a waiting list now and it tends to fill up. So appreciate that. That's awesome to have a waiting list. That's fantastic. And one other bug I do want to put in people's ears too is um, when it comes down to if you're permitting a feedlot expansion or permitting new feedlot, whatever it may be, um, sharing the story of these different byproducts and different feeds that you're utilizing in your ration and how green that is and how sustainable it is to, to have your cows be, or sheep being the ultimate recyclers, being able to utilize things that would otherwise be deemed waste. You know, that's a good part of your story to tell for that social acceptance of, of livestock production. So always try to keep that bug in the back of your mind there about being able to, to share the different things that your operation are doing to, to keep North Dakota going and to reduce waste and recycle. So that's the, the hottest topic out there right now for sure is sustainability, even though some people using the word probably don't even know what it means, but it is definitely the, uh, the hot topic in the world. So um, if there's no other questions, I guess we can adjourn and I will be doing a drawing for the awesome door prize that Brian donated. So. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Hoppy. This was a great presentation.